Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Very good. Very good. All right. So um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the Institute for the Best Technology and Public Policy. Um, how many of you have heard of this on campus? Okay. All right. All right. Not that many. That's okay. It's kind of tucked away over in uh, Jesperson Hall. So um, if you're interested, I can show you around there sometime if you want to um, if you want to come talk to me. But uh, first, I wanted to show this picture. Anybody know what this is? Any of those people look familiar? Okay, so uh, th this is this is Chibi, this is Reach Up, and this is the first CA CSAI club group. These are the founders of CSAI. They're working on Nimbus right here on this project. And this is actually in the Institute lab. Uh, so when when the club was, was first founded, I worked closely with them. I was an advisor on Nimbus because it's natural language processing. And uh, we did a lot of really cool things. I think all these people pretty much graduated, but that was a few, few years ago. So. Um, we have kind of a history with CSAI. All right, so who am I? Um, my name is Fouad Kashmud. I am the Forbes Professor of Computer Engineering. I graduated with a PhD in Computer Science uh, from uh, UC Santa Cruz. And my research work is in natural language processing and stylistics in AI, machine learning, and data science, and in games. And uh, you might notice that the Institute's research activities also are around these things. And that's not a coincidence just because it's uh, just a lot, of, a lot of the stuff that I'm into. Although uh, we are totally open to other projects, other faculty, other students who get involved uh, can uh, work on anything in the Institute. All right, what is the Institute. All right. This man, his name is Sam Blasey, and he was a um, assemblyman and then later a senator in the state of California legislature. And he's also himself a PhD in, in geology from UC Santa Barbara. He represented the San Luis Obispo area in the state legislature. And once he left the state legislature, uh, he founded this institute and he was interested in a lot of different technology. He was one of the only PhDs that was in the state assembly at the time, state senate later on. And he was interested in doing a lot of work with technology and public policy. And so um, he started this institute and his focus, one of the, one of the uh, top areas that I wanted to focus on was government transparency. And uh, this is um, a very unique thing that normally happens, um, that rarely happens. And normally what happens is when someone leaves the legislature, they go on to like lobbying. That's a big thing that they do, right? And uh, what have they learned, whatever secrets they've learned while they were in the legislature as a lawmaker, uh, learning about how the process works and who controls, you know, levers of power and so on. They kind of use, you know, for the lobbying clients. Uh, but this, this didn't happen in this case, right? So he was interested in doing a public policy institute that is nonprofit and open. And, you know, at one point he was the minority leader, which is a pretty high ranking position. And so him and his staff, especially who I worked with very closely, had a lot of this insider's knowledge about how things really work in the state of California, in state governments in general, right? And so focusing on that here was like a very unique opportunity because he has all this insider knowledge, right? So he founded the Institute around 2014. And by 2015, we had our first product, which was around uh, government transparency called digital democracy. And uh, lots of faculty and lots of students have worked on uh, the Institute, various, various projects. The stuff that I'm listing here are just a, just a uh, sample of the people who worked on the Institute and worked with the projects that we have. 
Um, Dr. Dekjar is probably the second most involved person in the Institute, and he specifically works on um, data science and government transparency projects. We also have, uh, at, at the very bottom, I almost forgot, we also have international collaborations. We've had people visit from Germany, from Austria. I've gone to Austria and uh, worked with uh, some partners there. We've had people from University of Miami. Um, we've had people from um, different universities here in, here in the US. Uh, working with someone out of UK right now. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of international cooperation too. And at the height, we had over 70 undergrads and maybe about 15 grad students uh, that were involved in various projects uh, for the institute. The, this is a picture that we took in, in the old institute offices, which were actually in the Baker building, which is much nicer than the ones we have now. But, uh, the, and then you can see everybody in the front right there. This right here is when we um, inaugurated the Digital Democracy Project. Does anyone know the guy standing over here? This is one of our students, Randy Rodriguez. That's Sam Blakesley. That's another student, Ashley Donato, who worked on Digital Democracy. Anyone know who this is? That's, yeah. Cool. yeah. I don't know who that is, but yeah. I have a question about uh, did Richard God do work on it? Yes. She worked with us. She worked on the digital democracy. Uh, she was in the picture that I showed earlier. Anyone know you guys? That's uh, that's California Governor Gavin Newsom, uh, who at the time was a lieutenant governor. He was a big supporter uh, of the institute. And you know, various other pictures of uh, people working together. So right now we have, um, we don't have that many, but we have probably close to 15 students, grad and undergrad. And we work in various labs on campus, wherever we can get space. Space is a huge problem with Cal Poly. You can't get labs, you can't get classrooms. Um, it's gonna be even worse because they're gonna admit a lot more students you know, in the next coming years. That's just one of the things that are happening. They're gonna try to go year round you know, with semesters and all that. It's gonna be um, even crazier. But uh, we usually have, you know, space wherever we can find. We have labs. So on the top, that's the uh, that's the computer science conference room that we use a lot. This was an interesting space we had in there for a while. We got in the middle of uh, building 26, which was this like ancient chemistry lab from like 1950s and 60s, and uh, that nobody was using. So they gave us that and we used it for a long time. Um, right now we're over in uh, Jesperson Hall, close to the stadium. All right, basically what we do is we work on various research projects and there is just some research projects that are much bigger than others. And, and then there is, you know, they, they, they come in various kinds. So what I'm gonna do right now is in the interest of time, I'm just gonna um, talk about the biggest research project and then I'll just touch on three or four other ones just so you get a flavor of some other projects that we work on here, okay? Now, what do, what do I mean when I say work on a project? Well, research project means that you're trying something new. It's cutting edge. You're trying to show that something works. You often work with a partner so that they can use what you do and uh, and uh, and uh, become like uh, a uh, test testimonial for what you actually are trying to accomplish. They say yes, this works. Put it in the field. Um, research in most universities, what they call R1 universities, like the University of California and like Stanford and MIT, the research is done a lot there, um, and it's very theoretical. In a lot of cases, very theoretical, and that means you're coming up with like some new equations and sort of new, you know, knowledge. You write papers about them, and then somebody else will take that up and try to implement it. What we do here, is Cal Poly, here at Cal Poly is a little different. We don't really work on the theoretical foundations. We kind of work on that implementation part. That still involves a lot of uh, new findings and paper publishing and things like that. And it will be a great experience if you're interested in grad school or PhD or something like that. We've had many people from involved in this project and, and just in computer science in general who've gotten, who've gotten into grad schools for a PhD right now. Um, 
but this element of implementation so that we can be sure that it works and the technology does what it says is very crucial because a lot of times, a lot of stuff that's just equations doesn't really work in real life. Things don't line up nicely. You don't have good data. You don't have good situations. It may be too expensive. And so we want to go all the way and actually see it working, right? And that's what we're doing. So let me go ahead and go into the projects. All right. So the government transparency projects, there are five of them here. And let me uh, just quickly go over what they do. Uh, so digital democracy, that was the first one. And the idea here is to, to expose what's available in the state government to ordinary citizens, okay? Robot Reporter was this project about writing automated stories based on what's happening in the state legislature or in any kind of government meeting. AI for Reporters is a project about uh, creating tip sheets, creating like uh, insights for reporters. And then Digital Democracy Reboot is basically the same digital democracy coming back and being modernized. And that's what we're working on right now. And tip sheets is essentially kind of like AI for reporters rebooted and more AI and more sort of like uh, uh, cutting edge technology added to it. All right. So specifically, what is the motivation? Well, very few people know that in the state of California, when you go to see what the legislatures are talking about, the people who are elected by the people of California, who are you know serving as elected lawmakers, they don't. There's no record of what they said. This seems very counterintuitive, but it's absolutely the case. There's no record. Nobody's written down what they said, right? Uh, in the federal level, that record exists. But in the state level, that record does not exist. So you have no idea what was being said and what happened in those meetings. There's no summary. There is nothing. There are votes, and the votes are taken, and the votes are recorded. So we have that. But unless you want to spend, like, you know, 80 hours a week trying to watch videos or go travel all the way to Sacramento to sit there and watch these hearings, you're not going to understand everything that's happening, right? And, uh, and this, this creates a huge gap. It used to be that reporters used to go um, and actually travel all the way to Sacramento, sit in these meetings, the meetings that their paper was interested in, their hometown paper, maybe like the hometown paper in San Luis Obispo was interested in like nuclear energy and water and like, you know, um, I don't know, like uh, uh, housing, things like that, right? And then they would go to the specific meetings, they would sit down, they would write notes about what they saw, then they would come back to their hotel rooms, spend a few days talking to various people who they identified in the meetings, get quotes and things like that, and then write a story. Maybe it will take about a week of their time travel back and forth, and then they come back and we'll write a story about it. Well, unfortunately, this model that's been going on for like maybe 200 years is no longer possible because it's just too expensive. News has basically been destroyed as an industry since the internet, right? I mean, it didn't happen right away, but maybe like by early 2000s, it was clearly very, very difficult to make money in news. And so you might have noticed that there is lots of newspapers that are going under. There are lots of like uh, newspapers, radio stations being bought by bigger corporations. And the reason they buy them is because they can give the same news to everybody, right? So if I buy like 500 newspapers around the country, the value proposition for my investors is that I don't have to pay individual groups to go around and write stories. I'll just write one story like from Sacramento, like maybe covering Trump or something like that. Everybody runs the same stories, right? This is why we don't really have local radio stations anymore. We used to have local radio stations that they had like local reporters. They would go and figure out what's happening in San Luis Obispo, but that's just too expensive, right? So this has led to declining media coverage uh, on you know, state and local things, uh, stories. Number of reporters has declined tremendously. Newspapers have, you know, being defunded. 
a few really big guys are doing well, but those guys aren't doing local reporting. So there's a lot of problems in the journalism industry and a lot of people looking into how do we solve this problem of local reporting. So, and this is a quote that I wanna share, for public interest journalism to thrive, computer scientists and journalists must work together with each learning elements of the other's trade. So because of this crazy situation that the journalist, journalism community has been put in, the industry ha has had to innovate. And now journalists have to learn about data, they have to download data, they have to know where to get information, kind of, you know, what can they do even though they're not there physically? What kind of information can they get? What kind of websites can they look at? What kind of like, in, you know, um, uh, remote kind of like interviews can they do? All these things that means more and more technology on journalists. And a lot of them aren't trained in technology, so they don't really know how to do this. So our goals in digital democracy is to, first of all, produce a transcript because that never existed. So we're, we're going to take on, for well, the state of California, writing down everything anyone said in Sacramento, okay, in the, uh, in the legislature. And then we add important information to that. First of all, um, you know, you might think that producing a transcript is not that hard. Do you have a question? Sure. Oh, okay. So uh, you, you might think that maybe producing a transcript is not that hard because there's lots of like tech that can automatically produce uh, speech to text, right? But it's actually tremendously difficult. The reason is the tech that does speech to text, um, first of all, is not very good. Now, it, it's good for most cases, but when you're talking about journalism and you're trying to figure out who said what, when you're trying to figure out who actually said something, and you want to put that in a newspaper article, you can't take a chance. It's got to be 100% correct because you're putting words in someone else's mouth. Yes. There's also tech for that. Uh, tech for? Uh, we use Buster on that. All right. Yeah. Okay. Great. Okay. So what you need to do is produce a lot more information, not just the correct transcript, which can only really be done by a human annotator, right? Uh, there's no AI that can spell my name correctly. And I wouldn't expect it to. Why would they? Like there is no, it's a very unusual name. Never seen anything like that. It's not in large language models. So very difficult to spell my name correctly. Uh, what about the name of uh, San Luis Obispo? Very difficult to get that correctly, okay? It's, uh, if you already know that what you're hearing is a city, you have a chance to like go look at the name of the cities and maybe find the closest one and, and so on. But most of the time, you don't know what you're hearing from a point of view of a system. So that has to be corrected. So we, we go through great lengths to actually have people correct these records, right? But then there's, a, there's something else. Who actually said it? Who is it? Who is the person who's speaking? The transcription system will take that. For that, we have to use other technology like face recognition, like voice recognition, like being able to parse the text that says like, hey, my name is Fawad, I'm against this bill. Figure out that that Fawad was the name, take it out and say that this was the uh, the person who spoke. Um, but, and then, and then let's say I got that correct. Well, to an average citizen who shows up and it says like, Fawad said something, well, who is Fawad? I don't know who Fawad is. Uh, that's great that I have a name, but I don't know anything else about it. Uh, what if this is a lobbyist? What if this is a person who, you know, used to be in the legislature? What if this person is being paid to say what they're saying? What if this person used to, uh, like, works for, like, uh, a big company who has an interest in what's happening in this meeting, right? None of that stuff is possible. What, what newspaper reporters used to do is like write down the person's name, go tap them on the shoulder after the meeting. Do you want to talk about, you know, why you said this, said this, this and that thing? And if they agree to it, then you can sit down and have an interview. Maybe in two or three days, we'll get a story that might be useful. Basically, it's going to be not possible anymore to do that kind of thing. Okay. 
Um, and then uh, what about the uh, you know different committees that are saying things? What what kind of stuff did they have in the past? Like I, I'm I'm gonna go to a committee and I hear what they said, what they're talking about today. Let's say about housing, right? But what did they say like a year ago about housing? And how do I know that what I'm hearing is you know information that doesn't contradict something they've said before? And by the way, it always does contradict. Like people say things like in the moment or as a politician, when people ask him questions, but they a lot of times said the exact opposite thing before. It's just that no one's paying attention. There's no there's no system to put those things together, right? And uh, what are the uh, what are the things being discussed? Like what topics are being discussed? What bills are being discussed? What is the history of these things? Lots and lots of information annotation needs to happen for all this, okay? And then on top of that. If you manage to get all of that correct, it just takes a lot of a lot of effort to get it, not just gather it, but make sure it's correct. Then it's how do I actually make that easily available to the public? Nobody likes spreadsheets. The general public doesn't want to come in and like look at lots and lots of data, 15, 20, 25 to 50 dimensional data objects, and say, like, yes, this is, you know. What, what, what they really want is to, to like search something and immediately get what they want. Very, very difficult problems, okay? So searching and alerting, these are, these are the problems that we're looking at here. This is the whole system. If you look at it, it's kind of a, it's a slightly older version, but um, the core of it is, a, is the same. So what you have here is the main database. And from here, we have lots of information that gets stored in there. A lot of it is coming from videos and footage of the things that people have said in the legislature, which don't have their own transcripts. So we do that. We actually have people work on uploading that transcript, making sure it's correct, do speaker IDs and all kinds of other things, put them in this database. And then we have all these other things, like who is it, who is their background, who donated to them, uh, what have they done in the past? You know, what was their like uh, previous record on, on different things? Like when there's lawmakers, what have, what kind of bills have they passed and so on? So a lot of that is available from state databases, but they're in very obscure forms and they don't talk to each other. For example, if I have someone who has uh, who is a legislator right now, and I want to know if this person has in the past, before they were legislators, donated money to like a, uh, you know, a, uh, a fund or another legislator and so on. There's no way I can actually get this information, even though by law, information about the legislator is available and information about who donated is available. It's just that there is no key to put those things together. There's no duplication. If I say John Smith was a, was a legislator, I don't know if it's the same John Smith who did the uh, who did the donation like six years earlier, right? These are some of the problems we're trying we're trying to solve. We're making some progress, but some of it is very very difficult. This is part of the reason why humans have to be involved in the loop, okay? And then once we get all this in here, on this side, we are having display systems that could that could have people coming in, citizens, journalists, activists, come in and uh, see what's happening. Search the site, uh, look, at the, uh, look at the data. Um, and then we also use some of it to do research, to pr produce insights, to produce tip sheets and so on. So this is the core of the, uh, of the system. And this is what this first version looked like. Right now we're working with the second version. But the first version was like this. You can go to a page. This is just one of the pages. And this is this will be a hearing that's happening. You can see the video, you can see the transcript, you can click on the name and get more information. You can see what bills are being currently discussed. You can see where this person is representing. You can click on the bill and get more information about it. Did it pass? Did it fail? You can click on the uh, votes to see like what the voting uh, that was happening here was like. Um, lots of information. Okay. Um, one of the lessons that we learned when we did this the first time was that even this is not friendly enough for most citizens. 
because who wants to watch this stuff? It's really boring, right? You got to be seriously motivated. So there is a gap here. There is there is information and tech that is important to your life. There is um, places where you can go get them, but there is this motivation missing in the middle. And um, you know we don't really have this problem because we are all in technology. Okay, we're not afraid of technology. We don't get you know intimidated by technology. But a lot of people are very different. Think about people who have like basically never really done much with computers, have completely been like in you know fields of liberal arts, let's say, and they're just they're not very savvy and they're kind of afraid and they don't have the self confidence. Okay, how does a, how does a person like that get their information? Because you know I told you this was like a recent problem, relatively recent, like 20, 25 years since the internet disrupted the whole business, right? But the same people used to be around and they used to get their information just fine, right? Because they used to get their information in a form that was very friendly to them. What was that form? Newspaper articles. That was the form. You could read that. It would be like all this data could be summarized in that article. And uh, no one's afraid of that. People have no problem reading that. And that's what a lot of people have done in the past, right? And what we want to do is give that to them, make that available for them. But in order to do that, we have to empower the journalists to be able to write those stories. Writing those stories automatically is an option, but it's not a good option because there's still so much information other than what we have in this database, even though the database is huge. There's just so much else there that depends on the lived experience of a person writing the story that you can't really duplicate. There's no way. So what you can do is empower them to do this work and uh, they can do the rest. All they need is some help, all right? So we got stuff, we got written up in Wired, and uh, different different uh, newspapers. Um, and then around uh, 2019, we started looking at this product from the point of view of journalists. How do we get journalists to get involved? Because before it was just about ordinary citizens and it kind of didn't work because they didn't come to the site and they were too bored. And the kind of people who came to the site were journalists, they were really excited about it. So journalists were using it more than ordinary people. And in fact, FBI was using it because there were all this like, information that they had to spend money and time trying to investigate like fraud, like election fraud, things like that. And they were essentially duplicating everything we were doing to try to do that. So they just went to the site and said, hey, this is our year, we can use it. So, so we came up with this other system to try to gain insights from all this data that we have and make that available to journalists. And, and we started calling it AI for reporters and now it's called tip sheets. And it's just electronic set of tip sheets. It looks like this. You go to a site, you log in. It's not live yet. And you can click on, so these are like headlines generated automatically, each of them relating to a certain government hearing that was held, like in the legislature. And then you click on one and you see all the insights, including the full video, the transcript, some facts and figures about like who's speaking and what ranking they have, quotes that you might want to use in your articles right here, um, background data, tables about how people voted and who donated to them and all that stuff, right? And even this is just a tip. This is just the this is just to make the make the journalists realize if they want to write a story about this or not. And if they do want to write a story, there's still so much else that they have to go investigate, right? Okay, now let me on move on to a second project. Uh, so this is, a, this is a fairly recent project with a faculty member from history. One of the things that I'm really interested in and the Institute is really interested in is this thing called digital humanities. Digital humanities is all about basically applying computers to like traditionally non-computing things like humanities, like journalism and political science and English and history and sociology, things like that, right? 
So we actually have a very distinguished, top-notch researcher here in Cal Poly, Dr. Cameron Jones, who's actually written a couple of books about this issue of identifying people of African descent who used to be in California before California was part of the United States, okay? So during the Mexican period and the Spanish colonial period, a bunch of people of African descent were here. Um, but we don't know about them because nobody wrote stories about them and the whole society was racist anyway, so they didn't really acknowledge them. And what they used to do is they actually had, um, they actually kind of changed their names to, to, uh, to be like more Spanish sounding so that they could get jobs. And the Spanish colonial administration, they were so desperate for people to work that they kind of looked the other way, even though they're racist laws that we can hire black people and so on. So they ended up with lots of black people here in California. This guy right here, Governor Pio Pico, was the governor of California, was the last governor of California before California became part of the United States. And uh, he was a Mexican, Mexican national, Mexican governor. Um, if you're from LA area, there's lots of streets named after Pio or Pico. They're, they're, after, they're named after this guy. He used to be one of the largest landowners. In fact, his descendants, uh, were they used to own the land that uh, that later was bought by uh, William Randolph Hearst, who became Hearst Castle. Okay, so there's lots of these stories that are that are there, and we have these crazy. Now, where does computer science come into this? Well, there are lots of uh, records, Spanish colonial records, like long form cursive records about uh, census and who was here and what birthday they had and so on. They had some records. They the first, the earliest ones is from 1790, right? And then later on, because of these parishes, like, you know, they, the whole administration was divided around these missions, right? And in the missions, they have records. They have baptism records. They have marriage records. They had uh, records of that kind. And so um, they, there is all that available and a lot of it has been digitized and some of it hasn't yet been digitized. Right, so we have that information, and what we want to do is try to understand by putting together family trees because we know we know some records from the census, we know marriage records and things like that. Let's put together family trees and find out exactly how many African people were here uh, from those records. So that's a project. Um, Anthony's working on that well, with uh, with Dr. Jones. All right, another project, Panoptic. Panoptic is an information-based, massively multiplayer online engine, okay? It, the, the premise is very simple, even though the project is incredibly complicated, maybe the most complicated project you've ever attempted, okay? The idea is this. How many times have you played MMOs? And in MMOs, you have lots of non-player characters, okay? And these non-player characters, they are really obvious to you that they're non-playing characters, right? Who's who's played them most here before? Okay. Yeah, sure. Sure. Tell me how you know someone's in a someone is not a real person but a but an NPC. Yeah. They'll say, hi, I'm Jamal, the shopkeeper. <laughs> exactly, exactly. They have a very routine, very routine like uh, pattern that they behave and say, right? You can't ask them more questions. Sometimes you can, but then they just answer the same thing over and over again. They, if you look at them, they look like they're robotically controlled, right? Shopkeepers, they seem to be there like 24 seven. So that can't be a real person. And all kinds of things that give this away, right? So, and this also creates another problem uh, or it relates closely to another problem. There's been lots and lots of AI work in video games. AI in video games is a field that's growing and there is a lot of work that's been done. But just a small fraction of that work that's been done in research schools, uh, top schools that are doing video game research like UC Santa Cruz, uh, just a small portion of what they work on has ever found itself to AAA games. And the reason is that these big studios they don't really want to take a chance on AI because they can't know exactly how AI is going to behave. And AAA studios have voice acting. And 
this this prevents them from using AI. Who knows why? What's that? Is it licensing? It's not licensing. It's not licensing. Yes. Well, it's because well, for multiple reasons. If you had like an AI like with text to speech or something with some voice, uh, first of all, there could be some legal issues with that. Secondly, uh, because it's another black box and fit into that, uh, there's a chance that it might fail on certain words and mm -hmm. so take the player out of the experience. Um, what if I told you there are good text to speech systems that could actually replace most actors, but we still can't do it? What do you think that is? Yeah. I would think it's a labor issue. I'm thinking of the strikes in. You're right. There is a labor issue. And, and what I would love to see is in this industry and many other industries that people could license their voice. Like if your voice is being used to do something, you should be licensed. Like it's totally unfair for you to be like reading something once and then a robot uses that same voice later on for free. No, that's that's what they that's what Hollywood actors also want, right? So I'm not specifically talking about that. The issue is this: the lines are pre-written, the lines are written ahead of time for the game. Every game has all the lines written ahead of time. Okay. Doesn't matter if a robot reads it or a human reads it. The lines are set in stone. If the lines are set in stone, what does that do to your player experience? Well, is, isn't that what causes the NPC feel like you know that they're a robot? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. So if this was a true AI system, right? If this was a system where where you would it would act normal, it would act like a like a normal person. You know, the AI, the AI agent would act like a normal person. You couldn't ahead of time write down all possible lines, right? But that's what's happening. Now, you can do this. There are systems in video game research that could generate language on the fly. So nothing is written ahead of time. But because you have voice actors and you have um, testing issues, this hasn't been adopted in the AAA industry, okay? So um, this also affects something else. Forget the NPCs for just a second. Think about the overall story. The overall story, the experience that you have when you play a video game, right? That's set in stone too, isn't it? Especially MMOs, right? I mean, you've got two kinds. You have sort of story heavy video games where your actions don't seem to do much at all. Right. Your actions are don't make a dent into the story. The story is written. It's on a rail. It moves on. You go from one stage, one chapter to another chapter to another chapter. And it doesn't matter how you play and who you play. It's always going to be the same story. OK. On the other side, you have a lot of sort of a, what we call sandbox games, where there's you can just run around, do a ton of things, anything you want, like in Grand Theft Auto, right? You can do a lot of other things and not be related to the story. Of course, they also have a story that goes on a rail, but they kind of compensate for this lack of freedom that you have during your story by giving, giving you the sandbox element so that you can just play, do whatever you want, do complete, completely ignore the story. But when you do that, you don't have any consequences. Like things that you do, don't people don't seem to remember the things that you did on your own. The only things that people remember is the stuff that you did as part of the story. Okay. AI can solve this. The issue is who is doing the writing? The writing is all done ahead of time right now. What if an AI could be doing the writing and it could be editing the writing, changing the writing in the middle of the game? Okay. Right? Uh, anybody ever watch uh, Westworld? Yes. Okay. That's what Westworld was, <laughs> right? I mean, science fiction. But in Westworld, you could, you could start an adventure with a bunch of robots. And then you could just do something completely different that the adventure did not account for. The robots would all react naturally. And you still have a fulfilling experience with consequences. Okay? And so the idea that we have to be able to solve this problem is this. In an MMO, you've got lots of players. And these players, they go around doing things. And when they do things, those things could be ingredients of stories for other people, right? 
In other words, imagine you're in an MMO and there's 200 people and there is like 25 people doing something interesting. What if you could take what they what they did uh, that was interesting and then you would make a mystery out of it for other people, like completely different 25 people who weren't even part of the same area. And they'd be like, hey, this has happened. Now you can have a quest, like this completely dynamic quest to solve this, right? In order to do this, you have to keep track of every detail of every game, every object, everything that has been done, every intention. And you have to have a lot of NPCs that are essentially indistinguishable from people, right? And that's what this project does. This is a this is my master's student graduated a couple of years ago. Right now, works in the game industry in the Bay Area, and we published a paper about this. Um, and that's um, that's one of the main areas. The the last uh, master student who worked at Apple graduated last year, and she put in the most time into this. All right, let me talk about the last project, and I'm almost done. Uh, botnet driven spam. So this is a project that I really like because it brings in security and NLP, right? Um, you have, you've seen botnet spam before. So these are like, uh, sometimes it's called forum spam. So if you go to a forum or maybe Facebook or nowadays X and Twitter and maybe ours, right? And then you see like, you know, you see a robot actually try to pretend like they're a human and uh, start like talking and then like say like hey by the way you can buy homes in florida or something you know something like that right this happens all the time and then uh, this is what this is called forum spam so they bring in so a bunch of robots are very inauthentic like accounts they come in and they kind of hit forums with specific uh commercial sort of like uh, sometimes commercial sometimes political uh, messages, right? And what is their goal? Like, at least the commercial ones, their goal is for you to uh, be able to Google like the thing that they talked about, or just click on the thing that they they link to, right? And uh, from the language, um, they want to make an association between what they're saying and some website. And uh, the uh, goal isn't necessarily just to get you there. Sometimes the goal is to SEO. That is to say, get the put a bunch of random links that looks like organically generated by humans, have Google go crawl it. It looks like there's a ton of random people are relinking to the site. So that site's that site's ranking will go higher. And if you have ads on that site, that ads, ads are gonna stop paying more. It's a it's a very like tried and true commercial like trick that people are doing all the time. This it's kind of a cat and mouse game with big search engines about SEO. Okay, and so what we did in this project was we uh, set up our own honeypots. We set up our own forums, kind of looked very juicy for these robots to come in and say things. It looked like there were just a bunch of people debating because these robots are, I mean, this isn't done manually, right? It's done automatically. They're like automatically looking to be able to log in, automatically log in, make an account, put in like some random like things about like, profile and then be able to just um, you know start posting things that's what they want right and if you have a honeypot honeypot means a, a system that you are watching very closely and they come in and write and they, they actually uh, start making accounts and write write spam you have access to a few things that you normally wouldn't have one thing is you know the IP address they used so you can see that there is like 400 accounts from the same IP address right? And you can see the language that they use is very similar because a lot of these things are template driven so that they write language. I mean, it's gonna be, this was done a few years ago before large language models. And I just think large language models are gonna just blow this up like crazy because it's just gonna be even harder to tell what's happening, right? But anyway, with this, you can see what they write and you can see the accounts that they come from. You can cluster together a botnet, you can reverse engineer the botnet, okay? What are the IPs associated with the botnet? What are the uh, language that they've spoken? You can look at, knowing for sure that like, you know, 10 or 15,000 accounts are coming from the same source, right? And then looking at what they're written, 
you can use machine learning to, to look at other things that look exactly the same that you don't know for sure what IP address they came from and put them into the botnet and start growing the botnet. Uh, yeah. Wait, so that reminds me, like, uh, like if you put like your name on like a website or something, you sign up. Yeah. Like, and then let's say like on Google, uh, like it knows your location. Sure. And your route or whatever, it could do the matching because they sell the data. Yeah, well, these botnets they don't they don't have JavaScript running, so you can't get their location or anything like that. But you get their IP address. Uh, the reason they don't have JavaScript running is that's really expensive. Although the newer ones did start putting like a whole um, um, browser simulator as their interface. Okay, and so um, anyway, we looked at this. We we went pretty far. We, we published on it. But uh, it's still on the table. Myself and Dr. Bruce DeBrule, like, uh, who does security at the computer science department, um, are interested in taking it further. Okay. All right. I've already been over time, so let me just stop here and uh, see if you have any questions. Thank you. Yes. The ones that I've mentioned here today are in various forms of ongoing. Like this, the this botnet one is probably the least active, but the other ones are more active. So they're going now. That's a, that's kind of a complicated question because some of them have funding. I mean, you have funding, you have a bigger team and other things you could you could do with it, like the digital democracy and. Chip sheets and AI source orders, they have one thing. The panoptic and botnets, uh, and uh, what else do they have? Um, the, uh, let's see, panoptic, African California, they don't have funding yet, but we're still active on them. So, yes, uh, uh, if you're wondering if you can get involved in these projects, the answer is yes. But the ones that don't have funding can pay. So you can, the involvement will be around like doing an independent study or a senior project or a master's thesis, which is a very common thing to do with the institute. Good question. So with your uh, digital democracy, you were trying to solve the problem of like, you know, video is kind of boring to watch. Uh, by empowering journalists who are going to watch the videos because it's their job. But have you also thought about having it dumbed down to a point where it's straight up on like mass uploading on TikTok and YouTube shorts? Because let's say these people who like back then they, they have a newspaper, by now they're probably old people, they have grandkids, they have kids, mm -hmm. and even old people are getting on TikTok or shorts or something. Okay. Uh, chances are information will reach them. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's like mass upload on TikTok, yeah. people will mindlessly scroll and then they hear something crazy and then they're going to be like, oh my God, and then scroll more. But then like remember it later. Okay. Well, it sounds like what we need to do is figure out what 15 second clip is important. There are so, a lot of good case studies, I would mm -hmm. say. Yeah. Because normally we have like a six hour video that he shows up like 40 times a week. Because and it's a very difficult thing to go through and figure out what part of it was important. Actually, if I could solve that problem, we it would be a lot further ahead. Studies show that the most successful YouTube shorts are the ones that get them to watch other videos on the channel. Exactly. So if you had a 15 second clip, yeah, of well, either on TikTok, or YouTube, of something that showed like a bunch of bombshells, mm -hmm. it would get even those like those uh, YouTube journalists to go crawling there. Mm. Uh, so in a way, it would already empower those journalists. Okay, so what, what you're suggesting, I sh we should we should make that video ourselves and then point them to go to the well, sources. Kind of, uh, like... I mean, that's, usually, like, that's, that's like good advertising. Yeah, what usually what happens is that uh, someone will make a long video and then cut clips of it and then put it into the short uh, and then like... The short's going to get 500k views instantly, mm -hmm. and then people, a portion of those people, will uh, go and watch the full video because they're curious. Okay. What else? Yes. I have a different question about uh, digital democracy. So, um, yeah, it's often a problem. I mean, it's, it's been a problem since you know print media that uh, journalists used to work very, very hard 
to avoid bias, to make sure that you know they weren't selectively presenting information. And of course, when you automate uh, so much of that, I would think that even even without getting into spin, just the the, the information chosen by the machine could reflect uh, a bias, not by those who programmed it, but but a bias in in what it's able to uh, throw together. So I'm wondering how this project has been received, both by legislators that are being that are the topic of it, but also by the journalists the journalism community. Yeah, very very good question. This is a paramount question. Any technology will have inherent bias in it. There's nothing you can do. I don't care how, you know, an objective you think you are, there's going to be bias. So you ask two questions. How is it received by the legislature? So it's not received very well by the legislature. I like I like right? The legislature doesn't want this at all. Okay. Um, the Institute, together with some allies of the Institute in 2018, helped pass a ballot measure in California, Prop 54, that actually like made this 100% legal. Okay. And Prop 54 said that you could use these videos that are, tra that are, that are transcribed, uh, not transcribed, but are produced by the state, and you could clip them and use them however you want, even for commercial purposes. Okay, The legislator didn't want that. Didn't want that at all. And it was like the most successful ballot measure that year. You know, it was like 80% for. Mm -hmm. And the legislators tried to actually co-opt it by saying that, hey, you guys who are doing the petition, take it off the ballot and we will pass a law that does the same thing. But that law could be changed later and all these things. And um, they didn't like it. Okay. Um, how was it received by journalists? So we've done a massive, massive uh, nationwide survey, and we've shown them tip sheets. And this is a question that does come up. Um, first of all, uh, understand that the place they're at now is terribly biased already. Okay. How do you think? Uh, here, here's a question that was in, in that massive survey. All right. You're a local journalist. You're interested in covering stuff about the legislature. That, in, that is about your community, okay? Where do you get your ideas? Where do you get your ideas, tips, right now to write about for that uh, stuff that's happening in legislature? What do you think was the number one answer? Social media. No. No. Really? Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe some of the younger ones would go there in the future, right? Uh, but no, that's not it. Oh, you repeat the question. So, if you're a journalist and you're interested in covering your local community with in, in the stuff that's happening in your local community in the legislature, where do you get your ideas to write a story? Like what makes you say, hey, I should write a story about this? <clears throat> yeah. Maybe the larger corporations media. Well, um, they don't have anything about local stories. Uh yeah. Maybe they have an inside guy, like uh, like, I don't know, Paul's uncle is like, uh, uh, like in the legislation, and then like, uh, Paul was like, yo, my uncle said this, you should write uh, a story about it. Okay. Do you think that's a scalable solution? Probably oh, not. No. That's not it. Paul had a lot of them. That's why I thought it was so scary. Actually, you're, actually, you're really, you're not, you're not too far from the real answer. Uh -huh. Okay. So, so let me, let me just tell you, let me just suspend the mystery, because it was a total surprise to me too, and it was just like, I was like, oh shit, it's really bad, <laughs> okay? The way they write stories is they look at the press releases of the actual people who are in Congress, in, in the legislature. Mm -hmm. So the office of whoever represents this area, like Don Addis right now, okay, represents this area, it's gonna put out press releases. This is what Don did, this is what Don worked on. This is like the, uh, this is the, the stuff that happened today. And then they take that and be like, yes, write a story about it, okay? What's the problem? Bias. Completely biased, hundred percent biased. Is Don Addis or any representative going to say something against themselves? Are they going to hold their own feet to the fire about things they may have said before? Right. This is where we are. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, on the on the very good question that you asked about how we handle bias here. Yeah. Well, we have two issues. We have two sort of like uh, 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 levels. One level is that everything here is a suggestion to the reporter. 
the reporter is still in charge of what to put in and what not to put in. The second thing that we make 100% sure that we have with everything that we produce here is that we have a, uh, a primary source evidence for everything that we say here. You click on like, for example, speaker participation right here. It says that this like person who, who um, presented this bill, this person right here, um, was a prominent speaker in this in this hearing. So you can be like, yeah, this person spoke, you know, prominently. How do we determine that? Click on this, it will tell you. We looked at the number of minutes they spoke compared to others. Here's the math, you can you can quote it. Uh, we looked at number of questions were asked. Here's the math, you can look at it. Click on every question, go directly to the to the video where the question was asked, and you can see, right? Over here, quotes. Here's some interesting quotes that people said you might want to put in your story. Okay. Are they accurate? Are there other quotes? Yes. We have a whole list of other quotes you can go down through. You can go exactly to the place where that person said it so you can see that you're not missing any context. Um, every other number that we have here has a formula behind it that is directly calculated from everything that is what we call primary source evidence. Okay. Yes, even despite all of this, it could be argued that there is a lot of, there's some bias that seeps in about like what's available to you to look at and what's not. That's true. That's, you know, with that goes with the basically everything. Like even journalists right now have that bias, right? But what's available to them. Um, they have never been able to do like a search about like say this one person over their nine year career, how many times they passed bills about healthcare. Never been able to do that before. I mean, they could, but it would take a week of their time to go to the archives and like figure it out. Now they have access to that and they could look at it and cite primary sources. So that's what we rely on. We rely on the fact that we are not making any judgments. And if there is any formula used to surface these things, those are transparent. So, so another sort, potential source of feedback occurs to me. I'm wondering if you've gotten feedback from this source. So yeah, if I understand you correctly, there's a, there's actually a human interface between the right. dashboard produced by the AI and what the, and the story. What yeah. people, and the story. Okay. Exactly. So do those humans who look at the dashboard come back to you and say, We're, there's a real paucity of information on these issues? Yes. Or we suspect bias. On these other issues yes there is a, there is definitely feedback now we haven't done that yet but that's what's happening like in the next few months okay cool right the system has just been released internally to our partner cal matters which is a non-profit news agency that so the number one non-profit news agency that covers the capital in california right and their reporters are going to be looking at this and giving, giving us feedback for the next few months and we're going to be making changes based on that also they promised to share it with other reporters throughout the state uh, as well. Yes, that's going to be an ongoing process. Tweaking this, knobs, you know, numbers, things like that, for sure. Nice. Yes. Is there any push that you guys are doing to kind of like legislate in transparency? Because I was thinking too, when you said that balance measure, yeah. like if you could get everyone to wear a mic or something, that would make the transcription so much easier. And so Absolutely. Much Absolutely. One little thing that, in fact, some other states already have this, right? California doesn't. Whoever's speaking, just like fill out a form that says who it was, just the spelling of the name. That's it. You know, they don't want to do it. They are not interested in transparency. It's a bipartisan thing. <laughs> and they're just they're gonna fight everything like that because what are you doing? You're just you make you're limiting their options. You're sh sh you know shedding more light. You know they're okay with like cameras being there because they know nobody's watching, right? And then their own people can clip the parts that are interesting and send it out with a press release. And then so you can see them in action and so on, right? But nobody's really putting the context together and they're okay with that. Um, it's just very difficult to get them. It needs, to, it needs to be someone who is just maybe from a younger generation and who just truly has no, has no selfish interest uh, to do it. I mean, a lot of people, even a lot of very good people who are in the legislature, things that a lot of like light being being shown on the inner processes of how power works actually prevents them from doing good things because now everything is public and they have to take a public stance and so on. That's a debate that we could we could have with like political scientists and so on. The public does have a right to see all that and they 
have constitutional right to to look at the footage and and be there and listen to everything. And so, just making that easier, I don't think is a is a problem anyone could have. Yeah. So, like, how for in like in development do you avoid with with something that involves the state the state legislature involved like that involves politics maintain like a political stance and no political labeling? You know, where it's like if the yeah. other party gets like pissed off about what's going on here, they're gonna try to like label do the market. Oh, it's it's a it's they only for, it's only for left wing nut jobs or oh it's only for right wing nut jobs. But at the same time, not wanting it to be able to like super PACs to share yep. like, information about candidates and like like oh look at all the bills they voted for the right party, like, right like, well like, this how do you maintain that power? okay great question great question so this goes back to the reason that we failed the first time because I told you we started in 2015 okay and anybody want to guess how much it, how much money it costs to run this like per year yes probably a lot because you are you guys using cloud computing or like. 100% cloud computing. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay. Uh, uh, probably like like we, we $1,000 per run. $1,000 per run. Per at least, run? At least $1,000 per run. Okay. Maybe 10000 Per year or anything? Per year? Probably 100 k at least. Yeah. Yeah. Over a million dollars a year. Okay. One million dollars per year. Right. It's a very, very expensive thing. To do, right. First of all, cloud is expensive even though uh, like a, a few, like Amazon, like a few of the of the um, services like EC2 seem cheap, but everything else is really expensive. You know, it adds up really quickly. There, there, all the clouds are like that. Google is not, not that different. Uh, second, we have the humans. They have to make the loop. That's expensive and it takes time, right? Um, Third, we have lots of computing that needs to be done because the processing eight, nine hour videos, they have to be done right away and be like in and out as fast as possible. So why did we fail? We failed because we had no revenue. Mm -hmm. So this, so we had philanthropic funders who would come in and say, you know, that's fine. We'll give you a couple million. That's what happened. They raised over $6 million, right? The first time. And they said, okay, uh, yeah, we'll give you like, you know, we'll fund you for three years, but after that, you got to figure out your own revenue, right? And what's the only revenue available? Really, the, the only kind of revenue was to make this for pay and give a premium product to special interests who already have a lot of money in lobbies and things like that, right? That was the only way. There were tons of proposals about doing just that, right? Well, people could charge like... $500 an hour for their clients uh, for something like that. If it, that Robbius right now, they do a lot of work just by hand. And it, you know, and it costs a lot, but, but clients pay it because it totally works. Millions of dollars is at stake in government funds, right? This could, this could cut their cost a lot in a similar way that like automated legal analysis is cutting costs a lot for like law firms, right? You still have to hire law firms because it has to be a licensed law. But then they don't actually have to look at the case. They could have some robot read it and give some give some information back and so on. And already a few of them have been caught doing that. Uh, so it's very expensive. And really the only way to monetize it would be to like cut out some people. Right. So that's part of the reason it didn't work. Okay. Now to the question that you asked about like, is this going to be like labeled and such? Well. We got really lucky here because we are under the umbrella of this thing called Cal Matters. Cal Matters is for an established news organization that already has a reputation for being bipartisan, nonpartisan. And things are being presented through Cal Matters. Yes, of course, there's going to be trolls everywhere, and the extremes of either side are going to still say the same, no matter what. But this is probably the best possible position for this product to be because Cal Matters is is the big partner, is the partner that's gonna have this. The second thing I would say is that unlike the first product where it was geared towards public, this product is geared towards journalists. So it's them that would have to trust it, not really public. This what I showed you over here, the public isn't gonna see any of this. This is for journalists. The journalists are gonna see it and they're gonna write stories and the public is gonna read the stories. Okay? All right, anything else? I think I'm pretty sure I'm out of time. Okay, thank you.
All right. Okay, so next Thursday, we're having Humane come and talk to us. They're a really cool company that uh, they work with AI and they actually just released their product. They're gonna come and talk to us about kind of more about their company and the opportunities that they have for students. That's gonna be next Thursday uh, on the 16th. And it's going to be from 11 to 12. Um, we will have free food. So you could get some free lunch and learn more about Humane. Highly recommend that you guys show up if you can. And then feedback form for today. Uh, please make sure you fill this out before you leave. And I wanted to, again, thank our guest speaker for joining us today and thank all of you for attending this meeting. Um, but yeah, hope you guys have a great rest of your Sunday.